Okay, fine. Hello, everybody, and welcome to um, our session entitled Migrancies. Uh, the phenomenon of migrancy is relevant to uh, many different experience, uh, experiences of life on Earth. And the idea here is to look at how uh, communities and individuals adapt to change, uh, whether climatic, geographical, or societal. Now, before uh, we open the discussion to our panel, uh, I, I would like to introduce all the members of the panel, uh, Emmanuel Bayamak-Tam, uh, Sarah Baum, and Monocon uh, Magen. We'll say a few words about their latest books, and this will give us the background then to uh, our debate and enable us also to discover some of the interest areas of our panel uh, members. So uh, we're going to start with Emmanuel Bayamak-Tam. Alors, Emmanuel, bonjour. bonjour. Alors, quelques mots pour, euh, pour vous présenter. Vous êtes originaire de Marseille, agrégée oui. de lettres modernes, co-éditrice euh, des éditions Contre-Pied depuis 1994. Euh, votre premier roman paraît en, en 1996. Euh, vous écrivez donc depuis cette date et vous obtenez le prix euh, Alexandre Vialat et le prix Ouest France étonnant voyageur en 2013 pour… « Si tout n'a pas péri avec mon innocence ». 2018, c'est Arcadie euh, qui reçoit le prix du livre Inter. Vous écrivez également sous un pseudonyme, euh, de, le pseudonyme de Rebecca euh, Liguieri. D'ailleurs, le livre dont nous allons parler, euh, vous le signez sous euh, ce nom. Alors, avant même de rentrer dans, dans le livre, comment s'opère le choix J'écris sous mon nom « Emmanuel » ou sous mon nom de plume, Rebecca Et Quelle différence faites-vous ouais. Alors, euh, effectivement, ça sème un peu la confusion parmi les, les libraires et les éditeurs et les lecteurs, mais euh, c'est depuis 2013 hein, que j'ai un pseudonyme. Euh, en principe, quand j'écris des romans noirs, avec un ancrage social très fort, euh, c'est Rebecca Liguieri, et, et mes autres livres, je les signe de mon nom, Emmanuel Bayamaktab. Pour aller très vite, quand c'est très romanesque, scénarisé à l'avance, c'est sous pseudonyme. Quand c'est plus poétique, moins planifié à l'avance, c'est sous mon nom d'Emmanuel Bayamaktam. Ok, alors là, on est dans un livre qui est publié par, enfin, sous le nom de Rebecca Liguieri, « Il est des hommes qui se perdront toujours ». C'est le titre. C'est un titre d'ailleurs que vous empruntez directement à Antonin Artaud. Oui, alors c'est vrai que j'ai placé ce récit sous l'égide d'Antonin Artaud. Bah parce de Marseille que, aussi. Voilà, Artaud, c'est quand même un Marseillais, même si les Marseillais le revendiquent peu. Finalement, il n'y a pas grand-chose à son nom dans cette ville. Hein. Il y a un lycée, peut-être un, peut un buste à son effigie quelque part, mais c'est un, une figure marseillaise importante. Et ce titre, euh, il est des hommes qui se perdront toujours, il se trouve dans un texte très euh, très pamphlétaire, très militant, car Artaud a publié en 1925, où en gros il dit euh, finalement il est des êtres qui sont voués à se perdre, mmh. alors laissez-les se perdre de la façon dont ils ont choisi de le faire, et c'est une lettre, en fait c'est un texte où il revendique l'usage euh, de la drogue, et de l'opium en particulier. Donc comme la toxicomanie est l'un des thèmes de ce ouais. livre, ça me paraissait euh, très approprié. Très bien, alors effectivement vous parlez euh, donc de la du problème de la drogue, plus, beaucoup plus généralement, si on regarde euh, le livre, on s'aperçoit que vous mettez en scène une famille euh, quand même euh, complètement déglinguée euh, dans une cité fictive de Marseille, euh, un père effectivement violent, euh, toxicomane, euh, qui maltraite ses, ses enfants. Euh, son seul regard encourageant finalement, euh, c'est pour les deux aînés qui ont… Euh, une beauté particulière et qu'il envoie faire des castings euh, pour en faire presque des produits euh, qui vont rapporter de l'argent parce que lui euh, vit de, de, de pas grand-chose. Alors, le livre est, est raconté par Karel, qui est le fils aîné euh, et qui raconte sa sœur euh, Henrika, son petit frère Mohan qui est handicapé. Euh, la mère, elle est présente, mais c'est vrai qu'elle a du mal à trouver sa place dans tout ce cafarnaum. Et alors, les trois enfants, eux, s'aiment, se soutiennent, euh, 
et, et, et pour tenter de s'émanciper finalement de cet environnement violent et toxique. Alors, expliquez-nous comment ils parviennent à sortir et s'ils parviennent à sortir de cet environnement. Alors, je ne suis pas sûre que ce roman soit un roman euh, d'émancipation ni de sortie euh, par le haut. Hein. Je, je laisse des choses assez ouvertes. Euh, en tout cas, les trois enfants ont une trajectoire euh, très différente. Pour ce qui est de l'aîné, qui est aussi le narrateur et celui par le prisme duquel nous suivons le récit, euh, on peut se demander dans quelle mesure il n'est pas aussi le dépositaire et l'héritier de la violence paternelle. Donc, on ne sait pas en définitive s'il va se perdre ou se sauver. En tout cas, il est concerné par le titre. La sœur, effectivement, euh, la solution qu'elle a trouvée, c'est de commercialiser sa beauté sensationnelle et de partir très loin. Hein. Elle, c'est la, la rupture franche avec le milieu social d'origine. Et celui qui a la trajectoire peut-être la, euh, la plus singulière et la plus solaire, mmh. c'est le plus jeune, qui est aussi celui qui cumule les stigmates. Hein, parce qu'effectivement, lui, alors, il n'est pas beau, il est disgracié, il est pauvre handicapé. Et pourtant... Euh, il va se construire une identité un peu hors norme. Et même si je ne dévoile pas la fin, c'est peut-être celui qui ne va pas se perdre. Mais là aussi, le doute est permis. Bon, effectivement, c'est ouvert hein, à l'interprétation, tout ça. Alors, dans le roman aussi, euh, vous offrez une sorte de bande-son des années 90. Euh, alors, je, quel rôle donnez-vous à la musique Parce qu'en fait, ça passe, on passe de Céline Dion euh, au rap euh, et, et comment opérez-vous ces choix Est-ce que ce sont des choix personnels ou bien est-ce que vous vouliez, euh, vous avez sélectionné un peu tout ça pour euh, une raison particulière Alors, euh, à l'origine du, du roman, il y a quand même euh, deux figures de, de musiciens, d'artistes, chanteurs, auteurs et compositeurs qui sont Michael Jackson et Marvin Gaye. Sachant que euh, non seulement leur musique, je l'écoute depuis toujours, je l'aime, elle me porte, elle m'accompagne, mais ce sont aussi des figures de fils euh, martyrs et sacrifiés. Puisqu'on sait très bien que le père Jackson a dressé ses enfants, et en a fait des sortes de petits singes savants, et le père de Marvin Gaye a tué son fils parce qu'il désapprouvait son mode de vie. Donc il y avait quand même cette idée hein, euh, de, que, que Michael et Marvin soient très présents dans le récit. Pour le reste, je voulais effectivement une bande son vraisemblable et réaliste. Hein, qui pouvait correspondre à ce que des très jeunes gens des cités, des quartiers nord de Marseille pouvaient écouter de la fin des années 80 au début des années 2000. Euh, cela dit, j'ai fait intervenir essentiellement des chansons que j'aime. Hein. J'ai même essayé de, de faire en sorte qu'il y ait une chanson par chapitre. Hein. Alors, mmh. ça ne fonctionne pas toujours de façon très exacte, mais c'était mon ambition initiale. Et un des fils rouges du récit... C'est un groupe de rappeurs marseillais dont je ne sais pas du tout si la célébrité a traversé les frontières, c'est Ayam, avec en particulier un album qui s'appelle « L'école du micro d'argent » et dans lequel il y a trois chansons, « Demain, c'est loin, petit frère » et « Né sous la même étoile » qui structurent un peu tout le roman. Donc voilà, j'ai eu envie de faire entendre euh, finalement euh, la chanson populaire parce qu'elle fait partie aussi de, de mes goûts et de mon histoire. Et, dans, voilà, et de donner aussi comme ça un ancrage sensoriel et musical au récit. Très bien, merci beaucoup pour ces explications. Donc, il est des hommes qui se perdront toujours. Alors évidemment, votre roman, votre roman offre d'autres thèmes que nous reprendrons peut-être tout à l'heure dans notre table ronde. Alors, maintenant, on va passer à Sarah Baum. Over to Sarah Baum now. Um, Sarah, uh, your debut novel Spiel's uh, Simmer Falter Wither was shortlisted for the Costa First Novel Award and won the Jeffrey Faber uh, Memorial Prize and has been translated wide, uh, in, uh, sorry, uh, uh, widely, including into French. Uh, the French title was Dans la Baie Fauve. The 2017 second novel, A Line Made by Walking, shortlisted for the uh, Goldsmith Prize. And in 2020, uh, during the lockdown, I suppose, you published your uh, first non-fiction book, uh, Handiwork, uh, which we will uh, talk about uh, now. Um, now, Handiwork is a short uh, narrative about your daily process of making objects and writing, exploring what is to create, what is to live as an artist. Um, Can you tell us more about what made you go from uh, uh, the fictional world to non-fiction work? Uh, yes. Um, 
Firstly, thanks for having me. Um, it's lovely to have an opportunity to talk about this book uh, at last. <laughs> this was supposed to be a year ago. Um, but yeah, I wrote two novels first and then I jumped to nonfiction, but it really didn't feel like a jump to me um, because my background is art school, is visual art. So I kind of started writing fiction in the first place because, um, because I was writing about art, perhaps art criticism is a bit of a stretch. Um, and, and so in my head, I suppose, um, it's, it's always been more perhaps in the tradition of French literature. I've always felt that I'm a bit more um, genre fluid, if that's the right way to put it. Um, so when I started Handiwork, I thought that I was just writing uh, a long essay, I suppose, or an essay, and then it became a long essay. And then at a certain point, I thought, maybe this is a really short book. Um, and uh, and so it was it was for me just a series of notes that then started to become connected. Um, and I suppose that's how I write nonfiction um, essays, certainly, is just sort of finding, making little jumps between things. And uh, and I do believe that if you um, <laughs> that if you if you work hard enough, you can make the connection between anything. Um, so it's it, it got to a stage at which I thought, OK, these things, these things make sense together. And I kept going. Yeah. Uh, did you write part of this book also uh, during the lockdown at all? No, no. <laughs> no. No, uh, it, that was total serendipity, to be honest. It was finished by the end of 2018. I wrote it. Oh, okay. Quickly. So, also, that's, that's that, okay. That, that came out in 2010, but it had been written uh, before. Um, within your book, you actually give a specific place to, to birds, uh, uh, real ones and other ones uh, that you make. You said in an interview that you became interested in birds um, and their migration in 2018. What triggered? Because animals were also present in the previous novel, dead ones, actually. Uh, uh, and what, what triggered this passion and uh, why did you decide to integrate them um, in your writing or through also pictures that you have in the book? Yeah, the, the illustrations in the book are, um, I actually had a series of other photographs. I've always, um, I'm a big fan of W.G. Sebald, and so I'm always sort of, <laughs> trying to do things that slip between genres or um, or integrate photographs in a kind of a, um, a spontaneous kind of way. So I had this whole other series of pictures and it was when coming up to Handiwork being published, um, one of my editors, Lisa Cohen, said to me, um, I'd love to see what this specific bird um, called the northern wheat ear looks like, because the wheat ear is kind of the central bird. It, it begins with that Um, and then it sort of is followed in some sense through the book. Um, and she said to me, I'd love to see what, what it looks like. And I, I couldn't put in a photograph because they're notoriously hard to photograph. I didn't want to use someone else's photograph. Um, and I can't really draw. I, I make things. Um, I make objects more so. Um, so I made, I ended up making a series of birds. Um, it's every bird that appears in the book, really. Um, and they're... They're illustrated, they're, they're illustrations, but they're photographs of things that I've made. That was the only way that made sense. Um, so that was one part of it. But yeah, no, the, it, I mean, I've always been interested in nature and in birds. And I, I guess I'd say that I was perhaps above average on birds. You know, I could name more than your average person. But, um, but suddenly, you know, in the way we kind of go through phases of being obsessed with things or the way I do anyway, um, I just suddenly realized that, um, that, that I suppose birds are, are, are omnipresent you know um you can go out for a walk and hope to see a fox or a hare or something but it, it rarely happens um but birds you will always see wherever you are in the world there'll be at least one bird you know when you're going for a walk um so so i suddenly became fascinated by um by this this ubiquity and how how there were so many that i didn't know and then as soon as you scratch the surface you realize um you realize how complicated it is you know how there's a male and a female that have different <laughs> colored plumage and how then the juveniles have a different colored plumage again and how they come and go at different times of the year and um so yeah so it was uh, i mean at the beginning it was it was a really interesting learning curve and then as as i want to do perhaps all artists are when you've spent a lot of time learning something you want to generate a piece of work out of it You know, it gives a great dimension to uh, to the book also. Um, the book is dedicated to your father. Um, is it also, in a way, about him and his legacy? And um... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, the book is essentially an exploration of this insistence that I've always felt to work with my hands. Um, I really should have been a craftsperson, but somehow I fell through the cracks and ended up in university. Um, so uh, my dad died in 2016, and then... Um, I guess I didn't, so I didn't start the book until about two years, but it was, you know, and he's, he's, um, 
it's obscure, you know, obliquely about him, as in he's certainly, it's certainly not a memoir about the death of my father by any stretch of the No, 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 no. Um, but he runs through it, and really it was his material universe that runs through it. Um, when he died, my mother gave me um, a photo frame, and all of the pictures in the frame, actually behind me on the wall here, <laughs> um, all of the pictures were um, of things that he'd made around the house and garden, you know, just things like um, gate and uh, cattle troughs and paths yeah. um, and uh, and it was I suppose her way of saying you know this is um this is his his material trail you know this is his legacy in, in in a very humble sense because he um he was a quarry worker he wasn't an educated man so it was an it's an, also an ex exploration of that and how all of the things connect yes where they connect. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you very much uh, uh Sarah for for this uh, the book is called handiwork um now, finally, uh, we meet uh, Monacon Magan. Can I start to Monacon? Oh, no, Dominique. That's great. 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 Perfect. That's the extent of my Irish, unfortunately. Um, although I, I, I learned quite a few words reading your book, 32 Words for, for Field. Now, um, Monacon, just you are a writer and a documentary maker. You have traveled the world. Africa, India, South America, you brought back books like a Journey Through India, for instance, radio programs. Uh, you have presented also uh, documentaries on issues of world culture for TG Kahar, uh, RTE and Travel Channel. Now, the book that we're going to talk about now kind of brings you back to Ireland uh, because it's about the, the, the Irish language and the richness of the Irish language and the title, as I said, 32 Words for Feel. Um, is already an indication um, both of the uh, of the richness of the Irish language and also the different way of seeing the world uh, it offers. And because among other things, what you explain in the book is that uh, how speaking Irish and English is different and offers actually two different ways of seeing the world. So how different is the world in Irish as opposed to the world in English? Absolutely different, like chalk and cheese. Um, and because this theme of this conversation is migrancies, the key reason is because of that migrants. So we have been on this island for 4,000 years, like DNA, only in the last five or 10 years, our, the DNA analysis has shown the Irish people have been here for 4,000 years. And then we have some of the DNA of the people who are here, that is the Bronze Age people, we are. But then we have some of the DNA inside of us, some of the people who are here before us, the Neolithic people, and a tiny amount of the hunter-gatherers who were here, who arrived 10,000 years ago. But when you have any people who have been on the same island for so long, you are going to build up this both dense word structure, word vocabulary for things, for nature, for birds. In fact, I, I should give, in honor of Sarah's father, I should give some beautiful bird words in a second. But you're going to have that the essence, the essentialness, the vast, like the way trees have huge amounts of junk DNA, over the centuries and over the millennia, you build up this storehouse, which modern languages like English and German and French and, and, and Spanish don't really have. You know, the, uh, modern languages are a lot more efficient, but they, but they lack that, that, um, that richness. And the other thing it has is this connection with the other world. Because of course, now there's nothing exceptional about Ireland. It's just all ancient cultures believed in the other world as much as they did in, um, in, this, in, in this world, in reality. And so almost every structure of the Irish language is connected with acknowledging that we are in one reality, but there are other realities all around us. And I often use as an example, the word, the Irish word for a place or a region or a district is counter, counter. But there was always the opposite of counter, which is alter, and alter is the other world. And everybody recognized what until maybe a generation or two ago that it was a thin veil. It was a thin line between counter and altar. And there were some people who could jump from, from one to the other. But can I just give you maybe three words for birds that give a sense? Like there's a word strion. Strion is a flock of mixed gulls over shoals of fish. Or the word droline. Droline is the word for a wren, the common word for wren. But it actually means dri am, druid bird. Now, dru is an old and Indo-European word. In fact, the same word is in, is in Sanskrit and Hindu. But because we believe the wren had this potency, was a sort of godlike figure, we, have, we still call it after the, you know, the druid bird. Um, and then there's lovely ways, like we look at 
we would look at animals around us in natural, in almost a childish way, in a native way. So the long-eared owl was kian kuit, which is like the head of a cat. Or our bat is skihan lahar, which is um, wings of leather. So it's this almost it's a nature-based, observation-based, very rooted-based language. And um, yeah, I could go on for hours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's no, it's fascinating. Yeah, uh, you also said that um, you have established that some Irish words have a connection with languages like Arabic. Yeah, I mean, so in some way, you know, I point out how dri, the word for druid, and all our poets, our poets descended from the druids. That's why they had this potency of word. That's why Joyce, that's why Beckett, we, we saw words as, you know, magic spells. So you'd imagine there'd be loads of words that there are in, in Hindu, and I could, I could, again, give you countless. But Arabic is interesting. You find words, like the Irish word for a harbour is kala. And then and one of the Arabic words for a port or a harbour is hala, hala, K-H-A-L-A. Oh, yes, yeah. It's, it's very similar. Or again, skian. Skian is the Irish for a knife. And you go to anywhere in the Arabic world and it'd be sikian or sakina or sakin. So there's this sort of seeming connection. Another one was scub. Scub is Irish, is a brush, but you go to Malta and Malta is Arabic, it's scuba. Why would this be? We sort of know because of migrancies. People were, this idea of nationalism, as we know, is very limited, very new. People were always, we were sea people, as were the Spaniards, as were the Egyptians. So the reason that the classic boat of um, the Glortog on the west coast of Ireland, the Irish Atlantic traditional sailing boat, is identical to the Tao that sails up and down the Nile in Egypt, is because those cultures were constantly interacting. And the best example of this is the shamrock. You know, we're a month away. We had St. Patrick's Day. The shamrock was everywhere, the symbol of Ireland. Now, shamrock, shamar is the Irish for clover. So shamro could be little clover. But and you remember, so St. Patrick saw the three leaves on a clover, on a shamrock. And he said, these were the three parts of God, the, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, it just happens that Arabic culture, pre-Islamic culture, had a wild plant called the shamraka. And the shamraka had three leaves, just like the shamrock. Mm. And it was three manifestations of a pagan, of a pre-Islamic um, Arabic god. Now, whether it's coincidence or whether it just shows we are all rooted to everybody. All ancient people, the minute we go back, we are one. And you take any old language, as I said, Irish or, or um, you know, Sanskrit or anything, and you will find these connections back to, to a solid whole. And that's what excites me. Good, yeah, very interesting. Do you have any questions, Sarah or Emmanuel, about the, the, the Irish language and uh, what, what uh, uh, Morakon just said? Could, could I just chip back in and say um, thank you for the bird names? I actually, I'm actually quite good on bird names, and this is one of the um, uh, one of the processes that I went through when I was learning about birds, because all of the good Irish bird books will have um, will have the, the name in Irish as well. Um, and and I was fascinated by the way. Uh, I mean, like like an awful lot of Irish people learned Irish in school. It's 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 pretty poor now. Um, but what's led me back to it has been trying to understand better the the environment that I live in, um, because the Irish words will expand upon it in a way um, that that Mancon has just explained really. Um, so like for example, one of the words for one of the names for swallow I think is something like etalogue which means then flighty creature so you know you're getting well swallow in English means nothing really um, you get a short description of the bird when you know its name in Irish um, so so yeah but I mean here to be honest that that kind of regeneration of interest um, in the Irish language has come to people like me through Mancon's many years of documentary making and writing so <laughs> Emmanuel, vous avez une, une remarque à faire non, sur euh, ce qu'a dit euh, Monacon sur la langue irlandaise, etc. Alors, pas sur la langue irlandaise en particulier, mais je, je l'envie beaucoup, hein, je, et j'envie Sarah aussi d'avoir plusieurs langues, parce que je pense qu'effectivement, euh, on, on peut changer de, de perception en changeant de langue, et que parler et penser dans une langue, parler et penser dans une autre langue, euh, c'est d'une grande richesse de pouvoir comme ça naviguer en, entre l'anglais et le gaélique, je trouve ça merveilleux. Bah oui, oui c'est effectivement merveilleux. Ce n'est pas mon cas, malheureusement. Um, alors, um, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Monacon. So, uh, your book is 32 words for field. Now that we got to know uh, our panel members a bit better, I would like to maybe move on to a more uh, general exchange of ideas on, on our topic, uh, migrancies. How does it affect us? how we react to it as human beings, what kind of a world, 
we want to defend or promote our place as human beings on earth, relation to nature, to other species, all that type of thing. And before, as a starting point, I'd like to um, take some sentences from what you wrote. And it seems that you establish a diagnosis of our world and our lives that is a bit worrying. Um, Emmanuel, alors, euh, vous écrivez par exemple, l'espérance de vie, de l'amour, c'est huit ans. Pour la haine, comptez plutôt vingt. La seule chose qui dure toujours, c'est l'enfance, quand elle s'est mal passée. Euh, Monocon, as a alors, you wrote that actually not in a book, but in an article that you published last Jan uh, well, January of last year. Um, where you said, as a travel journalist, I never thought this day would come, but I could no longer ignore the impact I was having on the planet. I suppose you were referring to all the, the travels and the planes and everything. Um, Sarah, um, it's a quote from your previous book, A Line Made by Walking. The world is wrong. It took me 25 years to realize, and now I don't think I can bear it anymore. Now, apart from Monocon, who applies the quote to himself, um, what do these statements reflect beyond the fiction? Alors, peut-être uh, first maybe Monocon uh, about this total change from I travel everywhere and I stay put in Ireland. Yeah, we, 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 we think 2020 was an important year because of COVID. We don't realize 2019 was such a key year. Like at the end of 20, at the beginning of 2019, I would never have said that I was uh, that I was giving up flying. As you say, I've been a travel journalist for 20 years for the Irish Times, with a column for RTE, for two, for, for many television programs and radio programs. And at the beginning of 2019, it would never have dawned on me that I wouldn't have flown. But 2019, because of the likes of the XR revolution and Greta Thunberg and the the new facts coming out of the UN about the reality of climate change. People shifted. We shifted dramatically to the extent, as you said, that I suddenly realized I could not fly again on holidays or for travel journalist purposes. And that was going to set up a whole new beginning for all of us. And then COVID came along and we have now been, you know, moved somewhere else. <laughs> so what we do know is that everything is in flux now. Everything is in change. We, we think it is because of, because of climate, because of COVID. But of course, equally climate change. So this is both an incredibly exciting time if one wants change. It's also an incredibly frightening time. Oh, exactly, yeah. Uh, Sarah, um, what is your own uh, uh, contribution to, to what he said and also to what you said, okay, within a fiction? But within, Yeah, yeah, within the fiction. I mean, I still feel like that somewhat helped us, to be honest. Um, But beyond the fiction, does it have a, an interpretation in... in the real world in the... Yeah, yeah, it does, absolutely. Um, and it's funny, just like um, Mancon, though, it's, it would be easy to, to fake this now, but I had the same feeling at the beginning of 2020. I'd said I'd turned down sort of invitations for various trips um, and because I felt, because 2019 had had that effect on me, I just felt that I couldn't justify, um, you know, flying somewhere, usually flying a long way for just like a couple of days Um, for, for what, really, you know, to promote my own books, which really is not a noble cause. Um, and for a couple of years, it was all very thrilling and exciting. But I had a trip close to the end of 2019. I went to Tokyo for a few days and um, it was It, it was magnificent and yet um, and yet also sort of horrendous because Japan was somewhere I'd always wanted to visit. Um, and yet my body clock completely failed me. And, uh, and for four days, I didn't sleep at all. So I couldn't sleep when it was supposed to be night. And then I was obviously completely exhausted all day. And when I came home, I just thought, you know, this is this is, you know, my body's way of rejecting this. It's not it's completely not natural to travel so far for such a short period of time. Um, and so I'd kind of come to that conclusion anyway. And now, yeah, it doesn't stand for much because none of us are going anywhere. <laughs> and all, and yeah, but they will. They, they, they will again. Or we will again. Yes, That's but there the... are better ways. I mean, I should still like to travel um, yeah. by train and over land. So, um, you know, I don't think it's a case of like, I can never, ever do this again. But how do I do it better or less? Yeah, okay. or just go somewhere for a longer time. Emmanuel, euh, votre avis là-dessus, euh, vous êtes euh, également euh, dans certains de, de, des choses que vous dites un peu pessimistes, disons. Euh, bon, que pensez-vous de, de tout cela euh, Alors, moi, le, 
ce, que, ce que dit Sarah, hein, que finalement, ça lui a pris 25 ans de constater que le monde euh, n'allait pas. Euh, moi, mon diagnostic a été beaucoup plus tardif, finalement. Ça fait, voilà, ce, ce constat que, que ça n'a pas, que ça ne peut pas continuer comme ça, finalement, c'est un constat qui est arrivé plus tardivement dans ma vie, mais qu'aujourd'hui, je, je partage. Euh, très clairement, il y a des voyages que je ne ferai plus et je me dirais, voilà, ça ne ferait plus des milliers de kilomètres pour rester une semaine quelque part, ça c'est sûr. En même temps, comment renoncer aux voyages qui sont quand même le sel de la vie et une façon de, de s'enrichir et de s'ouvrir. Euh, je constate que les jeunes générations, mes enfants, mes élèves, là-dessus, sont beaucoup plus critiques encore que nous et beaucoup plus radicaux. Hein. Euh, moi, j'ai des filles qui ne prend, prennent plus l'avion, qui ne veulent plus voyager en avion. Euh, alors, ça me rend finalement paradoxalement optimiste. Je pense que la jeune génération est plus radicale que, que nous. Euh, alors, pour, pour rebondir sur la phrase que vous citiez tout à l'heure euh, sur, sur l'enfance, dans laquelle on reste coincé à vie, alors là, je sors un peu du sujet finalement, mais c'est vrai que moi, mes livres souvent racontent comment l'enfance est saccagée par des adultes immatures, euh, égoïste euh, et cruel et donc euh, voilà ça participe à mon pessimisme hein, de, de constater autour de moi à quel point euh, l'innocence euh, est profanée euh, sacrifiée ah oui. euh, celle du monde sauvage hein, celle de l'enfance très bien um, I'll switch back to English um, well as you said um, it's it's not easy to escape the reality of the world we're living because young generations are kind of torn between the desire to live in a more respectful way towards the planet, but they also want to discover this planet. Now, Monocon, you said that you'd still fly for the sake of promoting the Irish language. Um, again, uh, some of the characters in Emmanuel's books and Sarah's books eventually leave their environment to look for something else. Where do we draw the line? Uh, for instance, Sarah, you were saying, okay, there are trips I won't do anymore. Um, where is the line between I do, I don't, and uh, how do I convey that to a wider audience, to the youngsters? And is he, uh, whoever. Well, Sarah, I, I, is he? Well, yeah, I don't think there's an easy answer to that um, because it, like the world has changed completely. You know, it's not natural for any of us to fly. And however I felt a year ago, um, as in, you know, I was willing to to curtail travel because of environmental reasons. Now I'm simply too afraid to go places. So, you know, so it's a moot point. Um, and young people have seen a massive change and they're growing up with a different kind of normality now. Um, you know, I think that's really encouraging. I mean, like I grew up in the sort of late 80s, 90s, where everything was sort of um, formica and linobium and processed food. And that was like, cool, you know, nobody ate butter, everyone ate margarine. Um, so like an awful lot has ch changed. And the way, the way that is innately being, the way children are growing up now, um, that they're going to be harder to, they're going to be much easier to persuade, you know? Do you agree, Maracon? Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting to have a conversation at a time of such flux. Like we know that our only solution as a, glo as a world, a global solution, is that we understand each other, is that we break down those national borders and see each other as one. And in some way, you would think that would require travel. And it probably does require travel to some degree so that we'd realize that we are not divided. And the last 15 years, one of the boons of the Internet has helped that, that we realize we are one. But we had this we had this sense of entitlement that we could go away on a Ryanair on a cheap flight every weekend. Now, what has happened over the last 18 months or two years, and again, it is nothing short than a miracle, nobody could have promote, could have predicted this, is that at least I know in Britain and, and America and Ireland, people are suddenly interested in their local. They had no interest in local plants, in local animals, in local food, in local environment, in swimming in local rivers or streams. And miraculously, all over the world, we have shifted and become engaged with local. As you said, I mean, I have this book out. It's a book about the Irish language. Irish people don't care about the Irish language, ever. My book would never have sold until this year, ever. My publishers knew that it wasn't going to sell. It was going to sell, you know, a few thousand copies. It sold out within three days. They republished it, sold out within five days. Everything that is really digging down into the local, in the same way as that 
I have been living here on my land for the last 10 years, growing my own vegetables, keeping my own hens, growing my own trees. And I just, I know all the, the vegetable growers or the seed suppliers. I can ring them up and get trees. This year, I can't get any of them. They are booked out. They open for 30 minutes per week, such is the demand. So just as Emmanuel says, her daughters have this entire new uh, mindset. So do a lot of people, it seems. OK, Emmanuel, uh, vous pouvez répondre. Effectivement, vous, vous, vous parlez de, de, de vos enfants. Um, ah. Est-ce que vous avez l'impression que c'est quelque chose qui est partagé par, par leurs amis, par exemple Quoi donc le, le refus de… de L'idée de « moi, je ne, travaille, je, ne, je ne prends plus l'avion, je ne mange plus de viande, euh, euh, etc. etc. » Est-ce que ça, c'est partagé Parce que… Euh, enfin, peu importe. Allez-y peut-être, Emmanuel, oui. Alors, euh, moi, je suis partagée, mais au sens… Euh, comment dire Je suis un peu hésitante hein, sur l'idée que finalement euh, le meilleur conseil que j'aurais quand même à donner à un jeune homme ou à une jeune fille c'est quand même de partir mais pas forcément géographiquement très loin mais, mais de, de rompre avec euh, son milieu social d'origine son environnement proche partir peut-être pour mieux revenir mais en tout cas euh, ne pas rester dans sa zone de confort et essayer quand même de connaître euh, un peu de, de se confronter un peu à l'altérité donc vous voyez à la fois euh, je vois bien que le tourisme de masse ne peut pas continuer, je vois bien qu'on ne peut plus continuer à prendre des avions pour un pour un an, et en même temps, je demeure persuadée qu'il faut que, euh, que les gens partent, enfin, quittent la famille, la ville d'origine, Enfin, ça, ça reste un conseil, me semble-t-il, à donner aux, aux très jeunes gens. Quant à savoir si la position de mes filles est partagée, je crois que malheureusement, elle est très connotée socialement. Mes filles, finalement… Euh, sont des petites privilégiées. Elles ont déjà voyagé. Elles ont déjà fait des grands ben voyages. Ça. Elles ont beau jeu de dire « Ah ben non, maintenant, c'est voilà. En revanche, euh, euh, nous, on vit dans une cité. Je suis sûre que leurs petits voisins et voisines, eux, ils aimeraient bien prendre l'avion un jour. Ils ne l'ont pas encore fait. Donc, je ne sais pas. Je, je, c'est encore en, en chantier dans ma tête. Bon. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of true. It's, uh, it's easy for us to say, you know, don't do this, don't do that, because we have, we've been there already, but uh, how to convince the, uh, the, the younger generations um, might be a bit more uh, uh, complicated. Um, now, looking at your books again, it seems that on the part of Monocon and Sarah, there is a kind of back to the roots um, language and land. And on the contrary with Emmanuel, okay, even if you're saying, Emmanuel, that, okay, you, you would encourage your children to leave home, but not necessarily to go far, there is still um, the, you know, you, 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 you're looking for something outside your familiar environment, uh, whereas with Monaco and, and Sarah, it's kind of back to the roots, back to Ireland, back to the land, to language. Um, am, am I right in saying that? Monaco, but, but, but maybe... Yeah, I mean, it's so hard because, you know, the minute we, uh, one is talking with writers, writers by, uh, by definition are an, a sort of an elite group in society. Again, as Emmanuel said, you know, we are, we are a group with particular um, chances and opportunities. And so, you know, if you, if, if you ask writers, do they know about organic food and do they sometimes eat them, the likelihood is quite a high percentage would. But if you ask like football fans or other groups or engineers, you mightn't get the same. So I am going to be rosy eyed. I'm not because I'm a writer who's been interested in nature for 20 years, I don't represent the mainstream. Um, but I, I've always but wanted to, to grow my own. You have to talk own. to the mainstream. One has no. to talk to them. Yeah. So what does one do? You want to, I want to represent my own spirit, my own inner spirit, which is idealistic, you know, which is probably not the norm. But I think there is a way of putting one's own idealism across in a passionate way that some people will laugh at and dismiss, but some people will think, okay, there is an alter alternative way of going, of doing about it. And like my life requires no lack. I have, I, you know, I, I eat so well, but it is all from the land. It requires a bit of work in the garden. But that's only two and a half hours uh, work every day that otherwise I would be possibly in the gym or, you know, or cycling. So these things need to be presented, not in a hippie, crusty way that we turn our back on the West, that's but it, that we yeah. have all of the advantages of the West. And also we use some of the elements of tradition. It's complicated, but it'd be very exciting if it works out. Sarah? Yeah, yeah, I'll chime in on that because, um, you know, you phrased it as sort of going back to roots, um, going back to the land. And I, I have a really uneasy relationship with that because I'm not, you know, I'm not from Maybe I didn't where I live. It. <laughs> I'm not. Um, sorry, sorry, I'm just hearing the translation there. <laughs> um, um, I'm not from where I live. 
Oh God, I'm having I'm having a, a technical error there. So maybe maybe Emmanuel. Emmanuel, yeah. Oui. If, if, if you want to uh, rebond on what said uh, Monacan, or uh, uh, vous exprimer sur sur ce sujet avec vos est-ce que vous voulez euh, nous, de, nous euh, faire sur, le, sur, sur quel sujet C'était sur le fait que euh, pour euh, les, les livres de Monacon et de Sarah, on a l'impression que c'est un retour pour eux vers la terre, vers euh, les, les, euh, la, le, la langue, etc. Alors que dans vos livres, euh, il y a quand même des gens qui essayent de sortir euh, de, de leur milieu plutôt que de, de revenir vers quelque chose. Donc, c'est oui. plus vers l'extérieur, alors ouais, qu'on ouais, ouais. le connaît Sarah, c'est euh, bon, ben, il a voyagé partout dans le monde. Euh, Sarah ouais. euh, va passer donc, euh, une année à écrire un livre pour décrire ce qu'elle fait au quotidien dans un environnement quand même assez restreint. Euh, voilà, c'était le sens de la… Oui, alors, mais ça vient, ça vient peut-être de ce que mes personnages, moi, je les saisis souvent à l'adolescence, à un âge où, de toute façon, il est euh, salutaire de ce que je disais tout à l'heure, hein, de, de partir. Donc, peut-être que la question se pose un, un peu différemment pour moi. Hein. Je, précisément, ce que j'aime raconter, c'est le processus par lequel on s'extrait, alors parfois d'une misère originelle, ou parfois d'un milieu privilégié, mais en tout cas, on fait les deux, trois pas de côté qui font que on, on va se construire. Euh, donc, peut-être que mon point de vue est légèrement décalé. Non, mais c'est pas grave, c'est très, très bien. Um... Alors, in your, uh, back in English, in your books, um, there is a link also with nature. Um, can we link the current ecological crisis to the fact that we seem to have lost sensibility uh, towards nature and other uh, living species, living beings? Have we lost that? Je ne sais pas, Monaco. Yeah. Um, so it's not only that the, the disconnection, well, first, I really am hoping we get back to Sarah because our idea of the, that it's complicated to get romantic about going back to nature is really interesting and really oh, rich sorry, and, yes, worth, and, and, and worth exploring, particularly yeah, in a place yeah. like Ireland that has such, we have, our past is so dark. When we were rooted with nature, 70% of some counties were dying of the famine. So when the likes of me, an idealist says, let's go back to nature, I'd love first yet to hear what Sarah has to say about that. Sarah? Yeah, no, sorry, sorry. Um, I could hear the, I thought that I'd suddenly learned how to speak French and was speaking it over myself. <laughs> no, I think what, what I was saying was just that I, I have a different um, sort of relationship perhaps to the land or to here because I'm, I was born a blow-in and so I will always be a blow-in. Um, I, and so, you know, I'm not from where I live. My mother is not from where she lives um, and my family are more scattered. But really, I think that's much more typical now. So for me, part of writing and thinking about the land and sort of relearning Irish that I'd forgotten is, is about trying to create a new form of identity, you know, for, um, for, for the Irish that we are now, you know, which is a more composite um, collection of things. Um, then, so, so it's not really a case for me. I never feel like I'm going back, but that I'm sort of trying to create something um, that, that is, authentic, is as authentic as what is already there. Um, and <laughs> though I never feel that I am. <laughs> okay. Um, Emmanuel, euh, dans, dans votre livre, il y a aussi, bon, il y a, vous parlez des quartiers nord de Marseille, etc. Mais il y a quand même un endroit, il y a une colline dans votre mmh. livre qui représente un peu euh, la nature, etc., mmh. où les gens font des expériences euh, qu'ils ne feraient peut-être pas ailleurs. Euh, Est-ce que la nature joue aussi un rôle important Est-ce que vous pensez qu'aujourd'hui, les, les jeunes ont perdu un peu ce sens de, de, de la, du lien avec la nature que La crise qu'on connaît aujourd'hui, ça vient aussi de là ah, complètement. Euh, alors, il y a de plus en plus d'études euh, scientifiques hein, sur le sujet. On sait maintenant qu'il existe ce qu'on appelle un syndrome du manque de nature, que connaissent même les jeunes urbains qui, qui, ne, qui, jamais, qui ne vont jamais dans la nature précisément, et il leur manque quelque chose qu'ils ne connaissent pas. Mais n'empêche qu'on on est sûr maintenant que euh, l'enfant a besoin d'être exposé à des milieux euh, sauvages et naturels. Or, les petits citadins euh, ne vont jamais à la campagne, ne reconnaissent pas un arbre d'un autre, ne reconnaissent pas un oiseau d'un autre et euh, des études ont vraiment établi que ça pouvait créer un, un syndrome dépressif, hein, euh, euh, des difficultés de concentration, euh, euh, de, de la dépression. Enfin voilà, là on est maintenant on sait que il faut absolument que les enfants aient un lien avec euh, le vivant. Et, et moi j'ai l'impression que nous vivons en ce moment un moment similaire à celui qui a dû être, euh, euh, enfin ce qui a dû se produire en Europe au moment de la première révolution industrielle, c'est-à-dire que c'est précisément 
parce que nous sentons que le lien avec le vivant, avec la nature, est en train de se distendre, nous sentons très bien que la fracture se creuse, que dans la fiction, ça se marque par un regard, alors je ne sais pas si vous l'avez observé, de romans euh, survivalistes, euh, de romans qui, qui précisément vont raconter l'histoire d'individus confrontés à des milieux sauvages, hostiles. Hein. Voilà, il y a plein de livres en ce moment qui ont eu beaucoup de succès, euh, ici et euh, autrement, j'imagine aussi. Donc, je pense que précisément, nous sentons que le lien avec la nature se distend et que, du coup, ça se traduit dans la fiction cinématographique et littéraire par quand même un… Oui, un, un, on, on remet la nature au centre, me semble-t-il. Je pense que le lien, euh, et le, il n'y a pas de déficit de sensibilité, il y a justement le sentiment d'une fracture grandissante qui fait que, euh, finalement, moi, moi je n'ai jamais plus écrit sur la nature que depuis que, que ces derniers temps, quoi. Alors, Monocon, uh, do you have any comments or anything to add or to uh, to say about what Emmanuel said? Yeah, I mean, I, I identify so strongly with what Emmanuel is saying. So either, you know, I was talking earlier about if a writer is saying one needs to eat more organic broccoli, that is not going to engage the mainstream. But if you tell them to go out in nature, if we find ways for people to go out in nature, nobody is not enthused. Nobody is not lifted by when they are connected with nature because it isn't in the brain. You know, science has now shown us that if we touch the earth, if we grow things in the soil, serotonin is released to the same degree as Prozac. It is the exact same results in the body biochemically. So this is not me needing to be a writer and say, be great and go out like Walden into the hills. Actually, we get people out in nature, they enjoy it. And so in Ireland now and all over the world, because we feel isolated and this existential disconnection from everything, which is bringing in, bringing on anxiety and sadness and despair. We need, we, we go on the yoga mat to try and find connection. We go to back to a Sanskrit culture, which is wise and all very well. But we, every culture has its own breathing rituals, its own dancing rituals, its own rhythm based rituals. Every culture in the world, because human beings knew that they feel better when they dance and when they dance passionately and so they breathe differently. So all we need to do is either take the traditions from our own culture or do it from other cultures but that's happening you know particularly in Paris and in, in Marseille these French melting pots where you see the cultural the cultural rituals from different cultures coming up and spreading among the young people there is great it is a great time, time of despair and change but one sees the roots of a new way of living if only we we give it the opportunity to flower Sarah uh, any thing to add any comments Yeah, um, well, I mean, there's certainly great a great deal of nature writing out at the moment. At the moment, it's experiencing a real boom that I feel like it wasn't even sort of five or six years ago when I was first writing, um, so, as exemplified by Mankon's book, I suppose, and the great demand for it. Um, but it's interesting what about um, kids today, because I've been thinking about that actually in the context even just of the pandemic, um, because what what I tend to see is um, a, a lot of of people my age now is are having kids <laughs> a bit old <laughs> perhaps but um the people of my sort of generation with small children um my sister and her husband for example um are very busy always working um but then their their child was then and this is prior to the pandemic um being minded by my mother and my mother was the one who was like getting her out in the garden teaching her how to plant seeds you know pulling pulling out old nests and stuff like that um and I'd, it's funny i've seen that disappear now in the last year since um since my her grandmother hasn't been able to look after her anymore um so i mean that's slightly different train of thought but i wonder if the um the pandemic will have affected it in a negative way but then also i mean with the pandemic like when handiwork came out the amount of people that were enthused about the birds that had never previously looked at the birds in their garden before um uh, was phenomenal uh, and i think birdwatch ireland experienced a, like a massive rise in membership or something like that so um so people are definitely looking more closely it's just a question of whether that's going to last or is it going to end and are we all going to like be so bored of looking at the wagtails and robins <laughs> you know like go and try and find some birds of paradise or something thank you very much that's unfortunately all the time we have this afternoon to um talk about uh, uh, migrancies i'd like to thank thank you all um uh, for coming in today uh, thank you for Uh, for, for talking to us, um, Emmanuel uh, Bayabaktan, Il est des hommes qui se perdront toujours. Uh, uh, sorry, Handiwork, uh, Sarah Bohm, and uh, 32 Words for Field, uh, Monacon, uh, Magan. Thank you very much. And um, our next panel. 
is at 5 p.m. and the title of the session is Mother Earth. Thank you again. Have a nice afternoon and see you soon. Thank you. Dominique. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.